There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast take With a down, dairy, 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 down, down Hello and welcome to a very special Haunting Season bonus episode of the Three Ravens podcast. My name's Martin Vaux. I'm a writer, storyteller and English romanticism obsessive, joined as ever by my partner in crime and all dark arts. Eleanor Conlon. Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs> yes. So this episode is our Super Star Wayne Halloween special released on a Tuesday of all things. What is going on? <laughs> Three ravens on a Tuesday. Next, it will be human sacrifices, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. <laughs> well, possibly. But we're releasing this episode today because it's actual, honest to goodness, Halloween, the 31st of October, which hopefully makes a certain amount of sense. Maybe. But Mondays and Thursdays are our days. It feels wrong somehow. Well, I did write to the authorities to ask if they could make October 31st a Monday, but they never wrote back. Still, we're already looking ahead to our Christmas special, and Christmas is on a Monday, so we're safe with that one, aren't we? We are, <laughs> and this is, of course, the last new new episode that we'll be releasing for a few weeks mm. as we're going to be taking a little break. Time to research Series 3, and honestly, after Series 2 and Haunting Season back-to-back, Time to have a little lie down. <laughs> yeah, we will still be releasing some new, new things on Patreon. So we'll have the November edition of our newsletter out tomorrow with all the month's major English folk customs, a new tarot spread to try, a unique magic spell, zodiac and Celtic tree information and more. And we'll be releasing a new Patreon exclusive for November on Thursday the 16th and our film club for the month on Thursday the 30th. Yes, we'll be talking about Pan's Labyrinth mm. on this month's Film Club episode. So do try to watch the film this month. It's absolutely amazing. And email us your thoughts about it for us to include in that Film Club episode before Monday the 27th. As always, if you'd like to support the podcast, receive all of our episodes ad-free and get access to loads of exclusive content, then do sign up for $3 a month or $6 a month at patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast. So now though, on with the show. Mm. And I suppose my first question going into this is how old a holiday or celebration is Samhain or Halloween Uh and I ask because in England there's a bit of a sense in some quarters that some of the modern Halloween traditions are actually relatively new and perhaps even imports over from America yeah well that kind of talk was very much the order of the day for our generation wasn't it when Mm. we were children the idea that trick-or-treating was an American tradition but that's definitely not the case because we have absolute and definitive records of Sarwain celebrations in the British Isles dating back Back to at the very least 3000 BC. Okay, well, that is a much longer timeline than I thought. <laughs> now, that's not to say people were trick or treating in England 5000 years ago, but as we will soon discuss, there is a long, long running set of traditions linked to Samhain or Halloween that, if anything, were closely observed in England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland right up through the 19th century, with the main fall off of a number of these celebrations actually taking place during the 20th century. Well, this sounds fascinating. I'm feeling we're about to go on quite a long and interesting journey. But before we do, can I just ask about the modern bit? Yeah, of course. So you just mentioned a decline or fall off of celebrations during the 20th century. Mm. Do we know why people stopped marking some of these or engaging in some of these celebrations during the 20th century? Well, it's a bit tangled, but in short, a lot of the regional pagan beliefs were intertwined quite closely with Catholic beliefs. And so, in the British Isles, as Catholicism and paganism were increasingly stamped out and stamped on during the 19th century into the 20th century, a lot of traditional celebrations were too. And there's a kind of double-pronged attack, one being a cultural attack, so about what was proper behaviour, and the other was empiricism and kind of the enlightenment with a growth in the belief in science. And I guess that feeds into what later became known as spiritualism. Yeah, exactly. So people stopped looking for ghosts as an aspect of religious belief and started to look at ghosts and hauntings as almost a kind of science. 
Yeah, and you get people like Harry Price and J.B. Ryan, Eleanor Sidgwick and so on. Yes, so if people have never heard of the SPR or the Society for Psychical Research, have a little internet search. Lots of serious people with serious academic qualifications throughout the late 19th and early 20th century all worked together to try and seek out and study paranormal phenomena. And then from roughly the 1960s onwards, the British Isles have increasingly lent back into Sarwane traditions. But that's all kind of very modern stuff. Very interesting. OK, well, with that question answered, let's jump back in time to, what did you say, 5,000 years ago? <laughs> yeah, right? roughly. I mean, some evidence seems to date from as far back as almost 6,000 years ago. But essentially here, we're talking about cultures reliant on transhumans. Transhuman. And I mean, I know what transhumanism is. Yeah. That people with powers beyond normal humans, like yes. psychics and cyborgs. And so on. <laughs> does transhumans refer to moving? Yeah. So transhumans is something different to transhumanism. It's spelled T R A N S H U M A N C E. And it basically relates to societies that lived side by side with cattle. <laughs> yeah. No cyborgs 6,000 years no, ago. No, probably not. But hey, maybe we just haven't found any yet. What we're talking about instead is a period of human history where people lived very much with their livestock so cows sheep goats and so on with groups moving around their native landscapes with the seasons in particular they would graze on highlands and uplands during the summer while the weather was good and then when the weather became worse they would move their cattle down and live in the lowlands where the wind rain snow and so on weren't so punishing well that makes sense the last thing you want is to be stuck up a snowy mountain with your animals all freezing to death yeah. and at risk of flash floods yeah, and so on quite so what evidence do we have that connects these societies reliant on transhumans to Samhain? Well, the simplest version is Samhain or Halloween mark the first day or Kalends of the dark half of the year. Kalends meaning the first day of the month. It's the word from which we get calendar. So for more or less, as long as we have records, stone or written, Samhain has been a pretty consistent part of human life in England or Britain more widely and in much of Europe. And it's kind of the first day of the dark half of the year. It's marked as a time of celebration, in particular, celebration of the dead. This is very interesting. So we spoke earlier in the year about Beltane, which is the pagan celebration marking the midpoint between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. Mm. And I know that Samhain is the opposite point in the wheel of the year, so halfway between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. Yeah, quite right. We released a Patreon special about Mabon, the autumn equinox, back in September. And all these holidays have deep-seated traditions associated with them. There are eight across the year, the two equinoxes, the two solstices and the four days midway between them in bulk, Beltane, Lunasa and Sarwain. And in terms of Samhain, also known as Halloween, whereas Beltane is the festival of new life and light and fertility, as its opposite, Samhain is the festival of old life, darkness and death. Yeah, exactly right. And we know that long, long ago, migratory human societies, those reliant on transhumans, used to make very special memorial sites where they buried their ancestors. So some very famous examples of these include, say, in Ireland... New Grange in modern day County Meath, which is a 5,000 year old passage tomb, or Sleeve Narman, aka the Mountain of the Women in County Tipperary. You've got Loch Crewe in County Meath, the Mound of Hostages, the Hill of Ward, Rath Crogan in County Roscommon. There are loads of these sites, pretty much all of them predating the pyramids, some by several centuries. <laughs> and we're both really interested in this stuff. But mm. in short, people buried the bones of their families in these places but they did so in interesting ways didn't they oh yes in very organized ways yeah so rather than burying people entirely as we might think to bury people they had kind of neat filing systems <laughs> with all the skulls in this section all the leg bones in this section and so on and so forth yeah precisely so what seemed to be normal practice was to leave bodies in the entryways of these big tombs so kind of the initial hallways where bodies were left to decay and be eaten by local animals and birds and so on and then when the bones were clean they were then filed away along with the bones of the rest of the clan from times past and what tells us that 
that these places were especially linked to Sawin. Ah, uh, well, he says, pushing his spectacles up his nose. Uh, on the one hand, we know the dead were honoured at Sawin because the beginning of winter marked the time of dying in nature. But more overtly, the doors or entryways into almost all of these ancient tombs line up with the sunrise and sunsets on Sawain. So although we don't have written records, the architecture itself makes the link explicit. That's fascinating. And so these nomadic peoples went to these places on Sawin. Not only that, at a great many of these sites, archaeologists have found evidence of the repeated lighting of large fires and evidence of animal sacrifice. So we know these places were used for celebrations. And the very earliest written records we have from around the British Isles contain accounts of the specific kinds of celebrations which took place at these sites at Sawain and their significance. Oh, wow. So when you say earliest records, what are we talking? Well, there are quite a few from different parts of the UK. But, for example, from around 920 AD, so we're jumping quite a way forward relative to where we were, the Welsh king Hywelda. Ever heard of him? Um, name rings a bell, but I think I'd probably associate him with the modern Welsh Senate for some reason. Well, for a good reason. Hywelda is famous in Wales for basically founding Welsh law. He was an ally of Athelstan and in his first laws, which we have copied out in later legislation, most Welsh legislation and the Senate contain many references to Hywelda even now. He's kind of the founder of the Welsh constitution. In his laws and customs, we have references to Calan Gaif, the first day of winter in Wales, as observed on the 1st of November, and Nos Calan Gaif, the night before, which is known as an Isbrindos, a spirit night. And that means it's a night when the spirits are abroad. And are the customs written about similar to those found elsewhere in the UK from the time? Well, there are definite regional differences. So, for example, we have a medieval Irish text, the Tales of the Elders, which contains like 8,000 lines of poetry, including the Fenian cycle, so the stories of Finn McCool, and the 11th century Book of the Taking of Ireland, which details the six invasions Ireland experienced in its mythical history and the law of places which includes the 11th century book of Leinster not all of these say the same thing and when you look at these books and others from Scotland and parts of England especially the Britonic parts so the West Country especially, although there are differences, some common beliefs and customs do come to light. Like what? Come on, you can't leave me hanging there. <laughs> OK, well, it's pretty much a universal that Samhain is the night of the year where the space between the world of the living and the world of the dead, also known as the other world, so the world of the fairies or elves, is at its thinnest. And as we've probably made clear on Three Ravens episodes in the past, the places where fairies and elves are often thought to live are on ancient burial mounds and holy sites. So people went to these places, these old tombs and barrows and temples and so on, on Sawin to see the dead and the fae and so on. Yeah, not just to see them, but to open the tombs up and bring their ancestors outside piece by piece. What? So people would go and get grandma's bones and great great uncle Monty's pelvis and so on and take them to the party? Pretty much. Wow, I love that. The <laughs> idea, oh grandma used to love dancing so let's get her legs out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it was very common for for people to return to these sites, open the tombs up, take the relics out, make them part of ceremonies, then put them back again afterwards with ceremonies for Sarwain taking place roughly from sundown on what we today call Halloween, then celebrating for a full day across the 1st of November, then winding things up by sun up on November 2nd. So this was like a three-day bonanza. And do we know what else happened in the three-day party? Aside from dancing a fancy jig with Great Aunt Hilda as FEMA. <laughs> well, yeah, we do, actually. And there's some pretty cool stuff, some of which may well be familiar to listeners, not least because some of this stuff still happens in parts of the British Isles today. Such as? Well, the first and maybe most important aspect of the whole shebang was the lighting of need fires. Now, these aren't just any kind of fire. They are a widespread tradition across Europe with need fires serving an apotropaic purpose. Apotropaic meaning something which averts bad luck or evil influences. Mm. If you want to know more about apotropaic magic, please listen to our Magic and Medicines Witch Bottles <laughs> episode where we talk about that in detail. So you can only light a need fire using 
friction. So the idea is that you make a fire drill, ideally out of oak. So a hole in a trunk laid down, then another trunk held upright, leaning down into the horizontal one with a rope, which is then spun round and round to create friction back and forth, back and forth, leading to the kindling of a fire. This sounds like the kind of thing that survivalists like Ray Mears and Bear Grylls go <laughs> round for, yeah. but they do it on a much smaller scale rather than with a whole section of tree. Yeah, I mean, people sometimes build frames to hold the trunks upright when they work, and different societies and communities sometimes only let, say, the men of particular families work the ropes and so on. Some people believe that the ropes should only be made of gallows ropes as well, or at least they traditionally did, which I think is pretty macabre. But anyway, the idea was once the need fire was lit, you were off to the races. From that first blaze, you lit bonfires, and then loads of other things came off the back of that. So this sounds quite similar to Beltane, which we talked about back in May, mm. where people and cattle are driven between two big bonfires to purify them from disease and bad luck and so on. Yeah, it's exactly the same. And this is in addition to things like storytelling, singing traditional songs, performing poems, dancing and so on. But it was common to burn juniper on these fires with the smoke from that juniper having special purifying qualities. The names for this bit vary a bit by region. It's known as seining in Scotland, senning in Ireland. But the idea is the same. People would basically completely envelop themselves in smoke. There are accounts and records of people laying down near the fires to be completely smoked out. And that's just one phase of this whole endeavour. Not great if you've got asthma, just putting that out there. But still, after you've been uh, fumigated from evil, what else are you meant to do? Well, one of the things you're meant to do is when you go to the Samhain celebrations, ensure that all the fires in your home are out. Then you light a branch or a torch or a chunk of turf from the central community bonfires. Take that home walk it sunwise around your house to purify your home and then light your fires at home using this kind of holy flame that would then mark the transition from the light to the dark part of the year and then you would do things like boil water on this new fire and sprinkle that water around your house to cleanse and bless it as part of this transition. I love that idea of a community fire spreading and providing new warmth and a kind of clean blaze to every house. Mm. Am I right in thinking people use the ash as well? Yeah, so once the fires had died away, the ash was spread onto fields to cleanse them of bad spirits, you know, protect and in some beliefs fertilise them. And the ash might also be used in medicines as well. But it was plenty of fun to be had before the fires went out. <laughs> I feel like there has to have been some sacrifices around these fires mm. as well. And we were talking about um, Fraser's The Golden Bow yeah. in our Corn Dollies episode. And he's definitely got some chapters about sort of fire rituals and sacrifices. Yeah. So as mentioned earlier, there is archaeological evidence of animal sacrifices at these ceremonial sites. So people would bring their livestock from the highlands to these places. You know, cattle, roosters, geese or sheep. They'd purify them, then some would be slaughtered. Sometimes some of the blood sprinkled on the threshold of houses, then meat from the sacrificed animals would be cooked and shared in feasts between the living and the dead. This is fantastic. And so I'm just thinking, in our village, we just had our annual bonfire festival mm -hmm. where we all met up and celebrated around a whacking great bonfire. So that tradition still echoes through to today. And I'm wondering if there are links to be drawn here between Samhain and the celebrations which we do on bonfire night, yeah. which in England traditionally takes place on November the 5th. Well, there absolutely is in that these traditions predate the gunpowder plot, obviously. But holding bonfire around this time of year is pretty deeply ingrained into our culture. So, you know, after 1605 and Guy Fawkes and so on, November 5th just became a new date on which to engage in this pretty old activity. But I'm guessing when it came to these feasts in the more ancient past, and I realise it's a little bit macabre to think of it, but am I right in guessing that parts of dead ancestors would be there, bones and so on, alongside any potential spirits or the fae or the dead or so on? Yeah, not just spirits, but gods 
gods too. Really? Oh yeah. So in Ireland, for example, there's this mythical race called the Fomorians. They're supernatural beings we might call demons in terms we covered in our recent Three Ravens bestiary episode. Anyway, they were said to have ruled Ireland before they were beaten and driven underground by the new gods, the Tuatha de Danann. We talked a bit about this on our Banshees episode as well. Mm. Some of the Tuatha de Danann include the Morrigan, the sun or light god Lou, and Bridget, and so on. Yeah, exactly. And there are lots of stories of Fomorians and similar demons breaking loose on Sarwain, such as Ailen, the demon known as the Burner, who breathes fire, and he said to emerge from Magmel on Sarwain to cause havoc. But as with all these myths, there's contradictory stories. So sometimes it's the Fomorians who breathe break loose sometimes it's the ic the fairies or elves and sometimes it's the tuatha the danan who need appeasing so people need to make sacrifices to these gods to keep on their good side yeah most definitely so one of their number the most important in a way is the dagda the great god who's associated with fertility agriculture manliness and wisdom along with a lot of other things and it was thought he controlled life and death as well as the weather and crops time the seasons i mean he's a pretty big cheese he sounds it. Yeah, so the Dagda is described as being this large bearded man or giant wearing a hooded cloak, wielding a magic staff that kills with one end and brings things to life with the other. He also has a magic cauldron and a special harp, and he's said to live in Newgrange. So sacrifices made at Sarwain at Newgrange were also in part to him to help him keep balance between life and Yes. It's interesting he has this dual nature, life-taking and life-giving. Mm. I mean, it's going to be really awkward if you get the wrong end of the stick, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, well... Is that where that phrase comes from? It may be where <laughs> the that wrong end phrase of the stick. comes from. <laughs> is there an actual separate god of death in Irish mythology, though? Well, there is one called Don, and that's Don with two ends, but it's often thought that he's just part of the Dagda, so sort of the Dagda's dark side, because in addition to often being described as married to the Morrigan, renderings of the Dagda are also sometimes extremely close to those of the god Succulus in ancient Gaelic belief, who's also pretty much identical to Pluto or Hades or Dis in the Greco-Roman pantheon, with all these gods associated with death and, interestingly, wealth as well. Yeah, I find this very interesting. And if I remember rightly, it basically comes from the idea that mineral wealth, including things like metal ores, gems, and so on, all came from underground. So the gods of the underworld had to be rich. Yeah, it's so cool, isn't it? And when, when we look at Roman records from, for example, the 3rd century BC or 2,500 years ago, give or take, the Roman Senate is recorded to have repeatedly ordained special festivals to appease the or Hades or Pluto, which took place, you'll never guess, on Sawain. Ah, oh, you're blowing my mind here. <laughs> and so you've already said we have this ancient evidence. Mm. We also have classical civilizations marking Sawain or Halloween. And then you were talking about 9th and 10th century English, Welsh, Irish and Scottish texts earlier. Yeah. But I have to wonder, because the Christian church was around before then, and we also have the All Hallows celebrations um, going into All Saints Day. Yep. So what's the connection there? Well, the first thing to say is that hallow means holy. So hallowed ground is holy ground and Halloween is holy evening. So that's that connection. And we actually have a specific set of dates for when the church got stuck into Sarwain, specifically between 731 and 741 AD, when Pope Gregory III shifted what had been Hallow Mass, All Saints Day, along with Halloween, so All Saints Eve and All Souls Day, the day that follows All Saints Day, to the 31st of October and the 1st and 2nd of November from Easter when it used to be because of Sarwain celebrations in the British Isles. What? So the church changed the dates when it celebrated All Saints because of British traditions? Yep. And what I find even more interesting is that when you look at how Christians celebrate All Saints, it closely echoes some ancient Sarwain beliefs. Like what? Well, on All Saints Day, in honour of all the saints of the church, these dead saints. Christian, remember the dead saints by leaving votive items and sacrifices to them and visit graveyards and cemeteries to place flowers and candles and to pray and sing about 
their loved ones, you know, over their graves or in the churches nearby. And in doing so, people used to believe this gained the dead indulgences. So basically extra time off the soul sentences in purgatory. Never thought of it that way. Plus, on All Souls Day, there's a really long running tradition of souling where bands of children and the poor went round to the houses of richer people begging for things like money, fruit, ale or cakes which if that doesn't sound like trick-or-treating i don't know what does and the cakes traditionally given out on these occasions are soul cakes aren't they yeah so they're made with allspice nutmeg cinnamon ginger raisins or currants and are topped with the mark of a cross slightly different to dumb cakes which are a longer running tradition what's a dumb cake mm. i've never heard of one of those We've, we wrote about dumb suppers in our newsletter this month yeah. that's where around halloween meals are laid out where a place for the dead is set at the the table and they're invited to join mm. and then you know food and drink is left for them as an offering and in some traditions a western facing door or window is left open and candles set on the table to guide the dead home well, a yeah. dumb cake just sounds like a cake I've made badly <laughs> and follow the recipe and it's all gone wrong so dumb cakes are supposed to keep you quiet so they are linked to the idea <laughs> that Halloween or Samhain is a great time for divination and there's lots of examples of this sort of thing from across history aside from from the dumb cake. I'm familiar with some of these. I mean, for example, bobbing for apples, which I guess we both did as kids, yeah. was seen as a kind of divination, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was, as was the peeling of apples in one long ribbon of apple skin, with that skin then thrown over the shoulder and landing in the shapes that formed letters. So that's a dead easy form of divination anyone can try if they have fruit with a skin or peel. Ask a question, chuck the skin and see how it lands. But to get back to dumb cakes, which I'm currently picturing as a kind of gobstopper, <laughs> what are they? Well, they're basically a really, really dry kind of cake, like a shortbread or an oat cake, but often containing salt. And the idea is that people would eat dumb cakes before bed on Sarwain then go to bed really thirsty. And then, if they were lucky, they would dream about someone coming to give them a drink, with that person being either a spirit carrying a message or their potential husband or wife or someone like that. Got to be honest, I don't really like the idea of going to bed thirsty. <laughs> no. Hydration is the key to performance, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> now, perhaps even more basic, though, and certainly more elemental, all throughout Ireland and parts of Britain, it was traditional for families to carve messages, hopes or prophecies or just the name of their family or individuals in the family into stones and then leave these stones either in a ring around the edge of the big community fires while they burned or sometimes they would throw these stones into the fires. Then the morning after, they'd go looking for their stones. And if the stones had split, that was seen as a bad omen. While if the stones were whole, then it all good good luck. That is so interesting. Mm. In fact, it reminds me of a kind of divination I've read about to do with hazelnuts, yeah. which are, of course, associated with wisdom in the Celtic tradition. Yeah, that's much the same. In that form of divination, the idea is that you roast two hazelnuts near a fire, giving each one a name or a purpose. So for a binary choice like... Like, uh, I don't know, should I buy that pony from Ronald down at number 32? Yes or no? <laughs> and then if the nuts jump away from the heat, it's a bad sign. But if the nuts roast quietly, then you should totally buy the pony. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the same idea can be applied to potential spouses, business propositions and so on. And just to go back a few steps, you mentioned some Irish beliefs about spirits. Do we know any other specific demons or spirits from other parts of the UK that were thought to cause havoc on Samhain? Well, aside from general ghosts and fairies, which are pretty universal from all corners of these green and pleasant lands, there are some specific ones, such as in Wales, the Irhuk Tuguata, who was a demon with the body of a black, tailless pig and the head of a woman. She was bad luck. She sounds like bad news. Yeah, you don't want to run into her. Then, on the other hand, there's the Kasig Fedai, the harvest mare, who's a beautiful golden horse. She's good luck if you see her, so keep your eyes peeled. And is there anything in particular we should do to either avoid or <laughs> welcome these lovely creatures? <laughs> well, transitional spaces are the places where they hang out. So churchyards, where you transition from you know life to death or from above ground to below ground. Styles, when you're crossing fields and hedgerows. Crossroads, anywhere where people pass through and make transitions. In fact, in coastal areas, such as in 
parts of Scotland. It's also thought to be bad luck to spend time near the waterline unless you bring sacrifices with you. So, for example, in some fishing communities, it's traditional to wade halfway into the sea, so up to your waist, with ale and food, and to give those sacrifices to the sea, sometimes spirits of the sea known as shoni, and that will placate the spirits and encourage good catches, avoid deaths by drowning, and so on in the year ahead. I'm pretty sure jack-o'-lanterns and mangle wurzels and so on, like hollowed out and carved root vegetables, are also meant to defend your home from bad spirits and the like. Yeah, absolutely. Jack-o'-lanterns, again, are a form of defensive or apotropaic magic. The idea was that turnips or mangle wurzels were hollowed out to act as lanterns and carved with grotesque faces, set outside houses or on windowsills, and intended to ward off evil spirits or supernatural beings. Their name, of course, comes from from will-o'-the-wisps or jack-o'-lanterns and those are the flames that you know sometimes burn and appear over peat bogs and marshlands and so on and although people may think the carving of pumpkins or turnips or swedes and so on is a more american tradition than an english one Not so. No, not so. This is an example of one of those traditions that left England and went to the US and then kind of flowed back across the pond in the latter part of the 20th century. Yeah, quite. So, for example, in the West Country, by which I mean Cornwall, Devon, Somerset, Dorset, Wiltshire, Gloucestershire and into Herefordshire, we have Punky Night, which is a very old tradition, at least 16th century. And that sees people walking around towns swinging jack-o'-lanterns, singing (laughs) a song. In fact, without wanting to put you on the spot, Eleanor, would you treat us to a rendition of the Punky Night song? Sure, but you've got to do it as well. (laughs) You ready? All right, let's do it. Punky Night tonight. It's punky punky night tonight. Give me a candle, give me a light. It's punky punky night tonight. Great. (laughs) It goes on. (laughs) It does. Uh, Thank you very much. So, punky night is just one of many, many mischief night traditions from around the UK with people mumming and guising. That means sort of dressing up as characters, sometimes from the Bible or as monsters, spirits, gods, and so on. Then going about knocking on people's doors. We have plenty of records of that, which is a a progenitor of trick-or-treating dating back, like I say, from at least as early as the 16th century. So I'm guessing that basically at the time of mass transatlantic Irish and Scottish immigration, so we're talking mid-1700s through to the Victorian era, people took Samhain traditions with them. Yeah, precisely. But with jack-o'-lanterns, for example, the first reference of the tradition in America is from as late as 1837, when making jack-o'-lanterns was actually part of Thanksgiving traditions. So carving pumpkins and so on only changed to be associated with Halloween in America in roughly 1860. Oh, so interesting. Mm. It's nice to know that Selwyn and Halloween traditions aren't such newfangled concepts. Mm. I mean, I always thought they were old, but maybe I didn't appreciate quite how old. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the average person isn't bringing their livestock down from the highlands <laughs> or necessarily <laughs> sacrificing their prized heifer to the Dagda. <laughs> but you can, I think, still see how Selwyn traditions have evolved over time from those beliefs about the liminal shift between the light part of the year and into the dark half and between life and death through this period where the veil is thought to be at its thinnest and the dead are to be celebrated alongside the living. Definitely. And so is it story time. I think so. And we're going to try something a little bit different this time, aren't we? Yes. So Martin's written this story, which is based on the folktale of Jack O'Lantern. Mm. But rather than him just reading it in the normal Three Ravens style, we thought we might read it together. Might serve as a nice bonus for this special bonus episode. And so for the last time this haunting season, we'll start spinning our yarn right after this. <laughs> Every Halloween you see them, looking out with ghoulish faces. It doesn't matter what they're carved from. Pumpkins, turnips, it's all much the same. The eyes, the smile, a flicker of light within. But what people forget is who that face belongs to, or where the tradition began. For although we all call him Jack-o'-lantern, few know he was a real man once. This was centuries ago, and at the time, he was known as Stingy Jack. This was on account of his never paying his bills, of his constant lying, cheating and deceiving. His ruses and tricks were so nefarious, in fact, that Jack could never stay in one place long for fear his past would catch up with him. 
He was always roving, seeking a new town or village in which to lay his head, along with new, good-natured folk to swindle. After quite a long life of dishonest, unprincipled behaviour, the devil, who was out drinking in what would later become Milton Keynes, heard some rather salacious rumours about Jack. How he'd dug up graves and sold dead men's fingers as holy relics. How he'd used dishonest scales to cheat merchants of their wares. How he'd promised marriage to a dozen young girls, had his wicked way, then scarpered on the mornings when the matrimonials were set to take place. The devil, being a jealous sort, felt rather envious of Jack's reputation, so set out to find him and discover if he lived up to it. At the time, Jack was, in his normal sort of way, drunkenly stumbling through the countryside, trudging through ditches to ensure any hounds on his trail would lose his scent. Only as he wandered, with the moon alone lighting his way, he tripped, splashing into the water and cursing, before noting quite what it was he had tripped upon. It was, to Jack's horror, a bloated corpse, which after a moment fell about laughing before turning itself into a very dark shape with leathery black wings. Hello, Jack, said the devil, who'd been lying in wait. Oh, hello, devil, Jack replied. This it, then? You come to take my soul down to hell? Well, yes, why not, said the devil. Any final requests? Hmm, thought Jack, wringing out his shirt, sucking his teeth and thinking. As you've asked, yes, yes indeed. My final request is one last taste of ale, just to wet my whistle. And the devil, thinking Jack's request was quite reasonable, acquiesced, transforming into a cross-eyed, if rather handsome, brickmaker. And so Jack and the devil made their way, side by side, through a few more ditches, across some fields, into and out of a woodland overrun with prickly bushes, and into a village Jack had never visited before. They made straight for the inn, and once there, Jack challenged the devil to a drinking contest. The devil, loving a wager, shook his brickmaker's hands with Jack, and they set about drinking their fill. As they guzzled down ale, yard after yard, the devil watched Jack, who even then was picking people's pockets. A ruby ring from a fat man's finger, a gold earring from a widow's ear, a silver crucifix from between the bosoms of the barmaid who served them. The man was deft, thought the devil, smiling and laughing, and the whole affair was rather joyful, all up until the innkeeper asked them to settle their bill. Well now, devil, Jack said, we appear to have a problem, for I carry no coin. I do have pockets filled with loot which I can trade for cash, but first we need to find a fence, and that may take us till morning. And what am I to do about that? said the devil. When I stalk the earth, I'm hardly minded to bring pocket change. Well now, Jack said, with a shadowy sort of smile, I have a tremendous idea. Why don't you, dear devil, transform yourself into a silver coin? Then the barkeep can be paid, and you can change back when he's not looking. The devil chuckled at the audacity of Jack's plan, so assented, turning himself into a silver coin. Only Jack didn't use the coin to pay for the drinks. Instead, Jack slipped the coin into his pocket, where the devil became nestled alongside the stolen silver crucifix. And the devil was stuck as small change for quite a while. Jack being Jack ran from the inn, leaving the bill unpaid. And after a few days of jingling the devil about in his pocket, Jack told the devil that he would only release him from his torture if the devil would give Jack an extra ten years to live. Oh, very well, said the devil, quite pained, for the silver crucifix burned his skin and made him itch, even while he was just a coin in Jack's pocket. Ten years is no time at all, and after that I'll be back to drag you down to the place where you belong. Ten years passed in a string of broken hearts, broken contracts, and broken promises. Jack spent time at sea, was marooned on a desert island, swam out to a Spanish galleon, pretended to be a bishop, scandalised the Princess of Portugal, and eventually made it back to England. Only there, one night, while Jack was wading through ditches, once again crossing the countryside, debtors on his tail, he slipped, tripped, and once again fell 
this time over the dead body of a horse. Poor nag, thought Jack, looking at the horse, wondering if it had horseshoes he could prize off and sell. Only then, in a puff of smoke, the horse disappeared, replaced by a figure with goat's legs and horns. Hello, Jack, said the devil, whose smile was so wide that it seemed to glow in the dark. Hello again, devil, Jack replied, bowing low. So that's ten years gone, is it? It's passed by in quite the blur. Still, I suppose you've once again come to take my soul down to hell. Absolutely, said the devil. Any final requests? Hmm, thought Jack, pouring water out of the straw hat he'd recently snatched from a market stall. As you've asked, yes, yes indeed. My final request is for one last bite of a juicy apple, just to fill my hungry belly. The devil, thinking Jack's request was, again, quite trifling, really, assented, which was how Jack and the devil found themselves making their way side by side through a very small hole in a very thick hedgerow, down a slippery, dew-soaked hillside, through a meadow of disgustingly sweet-smelling flowers, and over a fence into a farmer's orchard. "'Come along, then,' said the devil." Pick yourself some fruit. Oh, no, said Jack. I couldn't possibly judge which of these would be the sweetest. You have experience in this regard. I know that much from old stories I've heard. Why don't you pick the best apple for me to eat? And that way I can be damned happy. So the devil surveyed the orchard, then spied up high a particularly delicious, juicy-looking red apple. Being as roguish as he was, the devil transformed into a snake, slithering up the tree and grabbed the apple in his jaws. Only when the devil looked to descend through the boughs, he saw at the bottom that Jack had gathered up fallen twigs, forming them into crucifixes, laying them in a ring all about the apple tree. Oh, blast! said the devil, dropping the apple and blushing quite as red as the fruit he'd picked. Tricked again. How impressive. And what do you demand this time, Jack? Well, devil, Jack replied, wagging a finger, I've had a good long while to think this over, and I've concluded that to let you down from that tree, I'll have nothing less than your promise that you'll never, ever, ever, ever take me into hell body, soul, or otherwise. Is that all? Said the devil, raising an eyebrow. Aye, said Jack. That's all. And so, although it was quite uncomfortable, what with all those crosses laid round about, the devil held out a scaly hand and shook on the deal with Jack, and Jack kicked the crucifixes back into individual twigs, meaning the devil, after smouldering for a moment, could turn into a sulphurous cloud of smoke and disappear back to hell, where people behaved much more reasonably. More years followed, with Jack slipping deeper into depravity. He became a lawyer, got bored stole the crown jewels only to return them. After all, he'd accumulated wealth enough already, and he had his fill of ladies. In lieu of other things to do, he even learned the violin to quite a good standard, but gave it up as the sweetness of the music made him feel dirty and sad. Jack grew older and older, and his knees hurt and his back, but the devil never came to claim him. So after one last night of extraordinarily irresponsible drinking, which turned into two and then three nights, then a year, Jack, thoroughly pickled, ripe and reeling, eventually bought a length of rope, tied it into a noose, and hanged himself on the beam of a barn on the outskirts of Paris. So it was that with nowhere else to go, Stingy Jack's soul ascended to the gates of heaven. He had to wait in line for a little while as St. Peter was busy, welcoming good people into paradise and explaining how the whole thing worked, timings for choir practice, etiquette for the chocolate fountain and the all-you-can-eat buffet, times of the day, when and when not to bother Jesus with questions and so on. But eventually, it came round to Jack's turn to be judged, and he stepped up to St. Peter with a broad smile on his face. Well, well, said St. Peter, looking into his book of deeds and seeing the stains on Jack's soul. Nice try, Jack, but heaven's no place for the likes of you. Best try asking downstairs. Dejected Jack made his way down to hell, and when he got to the gates he begged to be let in. Again it took a while, perhaps a century or two, but eventually the devil came out to meet him. Hello, Jack, said the devil. 
fancy seeing you here. Oh, yes. Uh, Good eternity to you, devil, Jack replied, feeling rather sheepish. Long story short, I've been to see St. Peter and he won't let me into heaven. So I don't suppose there's a chance you'd reconsider and let me into hell after all? All this waiting around is rather dull. At that, the devil laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. He laughed for so long that Jack laughed too, only he carried on laughing and Jack realised that what was happening wasn't terribly funny after all. After he'd stopped giggling and snorting flames out of his nose, the devil told Jack that no, he couldn't possibly consider breaking his word. After all, even the devil keeps promises. But the devil did do Jack one favour. He gave Jack a piece of ever-burning coal right from the furnaces of hell. And although it hurt Jack a great deal to hold, he used that ember to light his way right on back to the surface of the world. Which, in a roundabout way, is the story of how Jack became cursed, doomed always to roam the earth, though dead, trapped between heaven and hell. And as a disembodied soul, he knows no hunger or thirst, no tiredness or rest, no pleasure and no pain. Thus, with little other choice, Jack O'Lantern wanders endlessly, carrying his ember, which he keeps in a hollowed-out turnip or pumpkin, with nothing else to light his way. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I'm <laughs> very happy to greet the return of your devil voice. Well, thank you, thank you. I thought it was a good time to dust it off. And also nice to end haunting season on something a bit sillier after quite grim stories. Yes, it's, it's been a month of quite spooky things. So it's, it was lovely to have a fun one. And I guess, is that the, the true origin of the jack-o'-lantern? Yes, the earliest version we have of it is actually Irish. But I wasn't going to risk us doing Irish accents. I think I think that might have offended a lot of people. Yeah. Yes, I can't reliably stick to any one region. No, indeed. (laughs) But it also is quite handy that this is a bonus episode, so it falls slightly outside of our 39 English counties structure. (laughs) Absolutely. And, you know, I I expect that versions of the story pop up in all sorts of places. Oh, yeah, definitely they do. But one of the things that I think is so interesting and so fun, which we've been talking about since episode one of Three Ravens, is this idea of the devil in English folklore as being being this kind of pitiable, easily tricked character rather than this source of demonic terror that he's since Yeah, become. he's actually quite likeable. Yeah. Um, you feel a bit sorry for him. Yeah, but... he's a pathetic character, really, yes. isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love the idea of the snake blushing and wait, raising its eyebrows. <laughs> it's a very amusing image. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for reading it with me. It was nice to perform one together. Yes, we never do that. We've, d- we've done it but once, haven't we? We have. And that was for a special episode of the Folklore Podcast, which Mark, the host of that podcast, has recorded and is edited, and hopefully that'll be coming out in the next week or two. Yeah, sometime in November, so we'll we'll let you all know when that's available. Definitely. And just before we go, we should read two lovely reviews that have just come in over the last couple of days. This first one is from Wisconsin Bear on Apple Podcasts, who writes, Wonderful and charming folklore. I started listening to this for the folklore, but now appreciate the Dying Arts episodes even even more. Thank you for documenting these ancient crafts in the hopes they won't be lost. The host's passion and knowledge for a wide range of folk tales brings a smile to my face because it reminds me of the tales my grandfather told me when I was little. He was from north of your border, born in Edinburgh, and several of your stories echo parts of his. Thank you for reminding me of him. Oh, thank you so much, Wisconsin Bear. That's so nice. Mm. I like the idea that it's it's me who's reminiscent of a grandfather, because I'm so wise. You are so, so wise. (laughs) We also had a lovely review from Brother Constant on iTunes, who writes, Absolutely charming. This podcast is adorable. The stories are entertaining and fascinating in equal measure, but what really makes the show is the dynamic between the presenters. They take such obvious joy in one another's company, and their playful vibe can always put a smile on my face. 
definitely give this one a try. So nice. So nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Constant. And yes, guilty as charged. We do take genuine joy in one another's company. You're great, you are. Oh, shush. People don't want us to be soppy. It's haunting season, for goodness sake. <laughs> you're ghastly. No, okay, fine. Yes, yes. And you're horrid? No, I can't do it. Eerie? I... Hauntingly? Beautiful. Hauntingly beautiful. <laughs> we'll go for that. Um, anyway, this is actually our last episode of Haunting Season 2023. And we really sincerely hope you have enjoyed it. As we mentioned before, we're going to be taking a bit of a break during November. We'll have compilation episodes coming out on Mondays, if you fancy just stories with yep. no banter. Mm -hmm. And then our second listener episode before we leap into Series 3, which is going to be a bumper listener episode. Oh, Thank yeah. you to everyone for sending us stories. At the end of which, we'll have completed our first lap around the 39 historic counties of England. Wild. And so many exciting places to talk about and tell stories from in the meanwhile, along with more magic and medicines, bestiary episodes, dying arts, and something wicked's is. Thank you as ever for listening to the podcast and to everyone in the Three Ravens community for helping us grow from a tiny baby podcast to what we've since become, which is starting to feel like it's maybe a bit more of a professional outfit. <laughs> I, mean, I think we can officially call ourselves podcasters now. Oh, can't we, we are definitely podcasters, <laughs> but it's also worth repeating that we are very aware that whatever success Three Ravens has had, it's down to you sweet listener and your efforts spreading the word telling your friends reviewing us on itunes apple podcasts spotify and all those exciting and mysterious places where podcasts live and grow and roam through the fields of audio <laughs> as ever please join the three ravens community on social media via facebook.com forward slash three ravens podcast instagram at three ravens podcast and on twitter at three ravens pod and if you have thoughts feedback your own folk tales to share or pumpkin photos in the next few days mm. please email us at three ravens podcast at gmail.com oh so good we have had some amazing <laughs> pumpkin pictures <laughs> through. Awesome, yeah. well done to everyone who's carved such incredible pieces of work we actually have a slightly sad story about our pumpkins don't we, we Martin? do yeah i mean we carved them <laughs> early so that we could have the photos to put on social media and enjoy our beautifully carved jack-o-lanterns yeah but we kind of wanted to be the first out of the gate to kind of encourage people if they were feeling nervous about carving their own pumpkins and sending them to us. Now, but <laughs> it's been quite wet in England yeah. in our part of the world, it's fair to say. So we kept our pumpkins indoors because we didn't want them to get rained on and, you know, fall apart yep. and, and be subject to <laughs> devastation. But unfortunately, both of our carved pumpkins collapsed in the house yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we had uh, a truly haunting mess to clear up <laughs> one morning I, I went downstairs did a double take for my pumpkin looks strange and that was because it had in fact fallen in yeah. <laughs> in a very grotesque fashion in, in a juicy juicy spilling oh, fashion oh boy it yes yes grim. that will live in my nightmares <laughs> so we sincerely hope that doesn't happen to yours and we'll be having a look through those pumpkin photos in the next few days and choosing our three favourites to win a limited edition haunting season mug yes indeed we'll take the limited edition haunting season goodies off the shop in the next week or so so do if you want haunting season stuff get in there and nab it quickly because it won't be there forever yes there's the mug uh, a lovely tote bag a cozy hoodie and a nice long sleeve top as well now patreon supporters we hope you enjoy tomorrow's newsletter and we'll have a patreon exclusive and our film club episode for november about pan's labyrinth coming your way soon and if you're not on the patreon already and would like to support us then please sign up for all sorts of juicy bonuses like ad free episodes and all the rest at patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast we'll be back before you know it and in the meantime thanks again for being the best community and best group of listeners we could hope for until next time though while our story's gone that way we'll go this way and remember don't whistle till you're out of the woods our theme song is the traditional folk ballad three ravens performed by eleanor conlon and ben harbour and our logo is by ollie james dare the Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks and such lean man With a down, derry, 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 down, down